Okay, so our next speaker is Tzachi Chagai, um, who will talk about the evolution of host pathogen interactions. And let's see. Okay, uh, thank you very much, um, and thank you all for coming. So um, our uh, lab works on uh, how does it work like this, like that, like that. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So uh, our lab works on the coevolution of uh, host uh, virus and their interactions, and um, we work on them in two uh, different levels. At the level of cells, we ask how the host species have evolved uh, during the course of evolution to uh, uh, inhibit pathogens, especially uh, viruses. I'm not going to talk about this today. Um, and at the level of proteins, we are asking how have viruses and their proteins evolved to very successfully and efficiently interact and modulate uh, the host cells in order to uh, successfully replicate. And I'm going to talk about uh, this today uh, on this topic of the so-called evolutionary paradox of host virus interactions. Okay. So uh, viruses being intracellular obligatory parasites have to replicate within our cells and they form numerous dozens, sometimes hundreds of interactions with our host proteins. And most of these uh, interactions are helpful for uh, the viruses to replicate, right? They need to interact with the receptors to get into the cells. They need to interact with the ribosome to get translated and everything in between. However, some of these interactions are also bad for the viruses. They're useful for us, for the host, because we employ all sorts of restriction factors here in, in the left that basically try to stop the virus from replicating in all sorts of ways. Regardless of whether these interactions are beneficial for the virus or deleterious for them, or deleterious for us and beneficial for the virus, it's always the opposite, uh, uh, these interactions between host and viruses introduce genetic conflicts because there is one side that will win and one side that will lose in this interaction. And this is why uh, we often believe that these, the interfaces between host and viral proteins that come into contact evolve rapidly. And why is that the case? So imagine this interaction between a viral protein, let's say, this viral protein wants to interact with us. For example, this is Spike from Corona, and it wants to interact with our host ACE2 receptor. So the virus will win, and we will lose, right? That's the case. So if that is the case, in the course of evolution, the host may evolve away by processes of a random mutation and selection, and this interaction that was beneficial for the virus will be lost. However, two can play in this mutational game, and the virus can regain this interaction by having additional mutations that will reform this interaction, okay? So overall, during uh, the evolutionary time course, we get many, many mutations all over the place in this battle, everlasting battle between the host and the virus. And so we say that often we see signatures of positive selection in those proteins of humans that interact with uh, viruses. And what do we mean by that? If we compare the proteins, our residues, uh, human uh, proteins that interact with viruses, with closely related primates, for example, we see numerous changes in our residues. Um, and this is well known in the field. Um, so we think that indeed the, these proteins, these human proteins that interact with viruses often evolve rapidly. However, many, many works that looked at the overall interactome of the whole human proteome, which proteins tend to interact with viruses and which do not, they show significantly that uh, uh, the proteins that tend to interact with viruses are in fact much more conserved than those human proteins that do not interact with viruses. So it seems to be in striking, striking contradiction to what I just told you before. Hence the paradox, the so-called evolutionary paradox of host, host virus uh, uh, interactions. So how can we reconcile these uh, contradictory results? So this, is, this was the question that uh, uh, we tried to answer in this work. And we hypothesized that we probably see here a mixture of different types of interactions that have different functional and biophysical characteristics. 
and uh, we took the approach of a uh, divide and conquer. Basically, we said, okay, let's take one type of host virus protein protein interaction that we can understand it in terms of its biophysics. I will explain in a moment what I mean by that. And from that type of, of interaction that we can understand very well its molecular level, uh, maybe we can understand this uh, mess, this uh, balagan that we see here. Okay, so uh, our uh, uh, proteins look like that. We have many different domains. Our proteins are multi-domains, usually. And we interact with other, these proteins interact with other proteins through all sorts of uh, uh, different domain modules. There are two main uh, 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 approaches that, uh, or, or methods that they can interact with each other, either through domain-domain interaction, so one chunk of domain goes with another chunk of domain, and then they form a complex. However, there is another type, much cooler type of interaction between a big domain and a short linear motif. So we have all sorts of stretches in our proteins, and within them we have these small peptides with a specific motif, a specific sequence that can repeat itself in different proteins, and these short motifs can go into this binding groove and form transient interactions with these domains. And uh, th these motifs look like something like that, okay? So you have an R or K, meaning a positively, uh, a positively charged residue, and then we have something, and then we have a tyrosine, and then we have something, and then we have another something, and then we have something that is not a proline. So this is rather a pathetic motif, right? But this is the real motif. And uh, do not underestimate the importance of these motifs because they are actually in charge of most of the regulatory interactions in our body. So they are often involved in cancer, for example. So do not underestimate motifs. And uh, we call the domains, the big uh, uh, green chunk that interacts with these uh, motifs, PRDs, for peptide recognition domains. And you may have heard of some of them. P-disease domains, SH3 domains are all types of PRDs peptide recognition domains. And back to the viruses. Viruses, when they want to interact with us, they need to follow our rules. So they either create these domains to interact with our protein through domain-domain interactions, or they mimic our motifs, okay? They can easily mimic a motif, and it's a great solution because it doesn't take a lot of space in their genome. And then they can interact with this binding groove within our proteins and form these interactions, which can be useful for them. Here is a real example from a crystal structure. This is a viral motif from SB40. You see the motif, it looks like that, and it goes into the binding groove of this big retina blastoma domain, the big purple chunk of domain, and it can displace. Basically, the viral motif looks exactly like the human motif, and it can displace it and form an interaction at the expense of the host protein. So it's a great win-win situation for the virus. And what we did here, and this is a slightly complicated uh, slide, so I'm not going to go into the details, but I will try to generalize it. So we took the whole human proteome, and we divided it into proteins that have these PRDs, meaning proteins that have a domain that can bind motif, here to the left. Then to the right, all the proteins in the human body that we don't know of any such domain. Then we said, okay, we have a subset of these and a subset of that that are known to interact with viruses based on publicly available data. Okay, so these are the purple ones. And if we go to here, from these proteins, what, what we basically know that they interact with viruses and they have a domain that can bind motif. We then have a subset of them that we think we know, I, I will not say why, but trust me on that, that the viruses interact with these domains through motif domain interactions, and we have an even smaller subset where experimentally it was validated that viruses used these motifs to interact with these human proteins. So we have different subsets of these proteins with different certain uh, uh, levels of certainties regarding whether they interact with motifs or not, with viral motifs or not. I hope everybody is following me. This is a bit complicated. And here is the evolutionary analysis we did on them. So this is the human a, a proteome, all the 20,000 or so coding a, a genes. This is their evolutionary rate. High means highly evolving, rapidly evolving. Low means highly conserved. And you see that the, the box plots, the distributions in purple, which are 
viral binding proteins, they tend to be lower, meaning that viral proteins, by and large, indeed, are more conserved. Now, if we look at this set of proteins, these are the viral proteins with the domains, sorry, the, the viral binding proteins with the domains, they tend to be even more conserved than all the rest of the proteins. And if you go to the left and to the left, for example, to the experimentally validated human proteins that we know that viruses are mimicking motifs to interact with them, they constitute an extremely conserved subset of the human proteome. So the bottom line of this fairly complicated slide is when viruses mimic our short and simple motifs to target human proteins, they target extremely conserved human proteins, okay? And we can continue using our uh, biophysical analysis to take these human proteins and to split them into the, their domains and look at the evolutionary rate. And again, without go going into technical details, the domains that bind the motifs tend to be more conserved than domains that don't bind motifs within the same protein. So it's not that viruses only target conserved proteins, they also target conserved regions within these proteins. And we can also split this domain that bind motifs into the core, the surface, and the interface. The interface being the part, the region that actually binds the motif. And what we saw here, when we contrasted the same domain, only domains that are known to bind vi viral motifs and domains that are not known to bind viral motifs, we see that the interface always tend to be more conserved when the viruses tend to interact with them through these motifs. And if we, subs if we divide these into those that interact with one viral motif or with motifs from several viruses, so the, the uh, region, these interfaces that are bound by several unrelated viruses are even more conserved. So basically viruses evolved to interact with extremely conserved subset of the human proteome and to target extremely conserved binding grooves. Okay, so this is a bit dirty, right? What, what they are doing. And why is that? It's because those proteins are not only conserved, they are also biophysically constrained. And what do I mean by biophysically constrained? If we count the number of interactions these human proteins form with other human proteins. So now the y-axis is protein-protein interactions within our cells unrelated to viruses. You see the opposite trend of what I just showed you. So basically, the purple proteins to the left, which are the ones that are targeted by viral motifs, tend to interact with numerous hundreds of human proteins. And again, I'm not going to show it to you here, but you have to trust me. Most of these human proteins bind these purple human proteins through the same motifs. So basically, the viruses are targeting domains that are interacting with human proteins through the same mechanism. So we have hundreds of proteins that interact with this binding group in exactly the same manner that the viruses will interact with. So that means that this is why it's so conserved, right? Because we cannot evolve away from these interactions. If we evolve away from the interactions with the motifs from the viruses, we will also evolve away from our own human-human interactions, which is not a very good idea, so we don't do it. In also, to, 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 to make things even more complicated, these purple proteins tend to be highly expressed across many tissues, and then tend to be enriched with essential functions. So these proteins that viruses are targeting with motifs are extremely important, extremely conserved, interact with numerous proteins in exactly the same way that the virus is mimicking. They are highly expressed and they are essential. So they're basically sitting ducks that the viruses can interact with and we cannot evolve anything in these proteins. So now you ask, but wait, you were telling us just a couple of minutes ago about all these signatures of positive selection and you remember the blue and the, and the red proteins being in some sort of an evolutionary battle. So where are these signatures of positive selection? So we took a subset of, of, of human proteins that are known to rapidly evolve, extremely rapidly evolve in the course of primate evolution. And we were asking, OK, which one of them interacts with virus and how? And we saw the exact opposite of what I was just telling you. So basically, almost none of them 
uh, has a domain that binds motif, okay? So this is the other class of proteins that interact with viruses. And when we look deeper into their function and into their biophysics, we see that these proteins that evolve rapidly in the course of primate evolution and also interact with viruses have very few proteins, have, 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 have very few protein-protein interactions with other human proteins. They are expressed in a low manner, in a tissue-specific manner. They, they are not essential. And the residues that actually interact with viruses tend to be loose, meaning they don't form many interactions with other residues. So these are the few liberal, loose residues that can evolve in whatever way they want. This is the exact opposite of what I was just telling you about the domains that bind motifs. And here is the model that I hope will resolve everything, or at least part of what I was saying. So viruses, when they go into the cell, they interact with numerous proteins. The uh, a minority of these proteins, we call them restriction factors. These are the proteins, the human proteins that go against the viruses. These guys are specific. They have specific functions. They go against the virus. So an evolutionary battle, an arms race can happen here, right? Because they're specific to fight the virus. So this can evolve rapidly. However, the majority of interactions that our that viruses form are with what we call host factors, meaning human proteins that assist unwillingly the viruses to replicate. The majority of them are evolutionarily constrained. We saw an extreme example today when we looked at the, the, the poor human proteins that interact with viruses through the main motif interactions. So this is the majority. The minority are actually evolvable. These are the ones with the few interactions and with these loose residues that can evolve away. They can escape these interactions. Now, one more point to think about. When we talk about host virus protein protein interactions, the data that exists is almost exclusively human virus protein protein interactions. And why is that important to this model? Because we only have data from human those few proteins that are evolvable, some of them are winning in the evolutionary battle when we look at the human protein. Okay, so they will not be captured when we look at whether they interact with the viruses because they evolved away. Had we looked at chimp or mouse or whatever, maybe we would have captured more of that. So basically going back to the evolutionary paradox from the beginning, both sides are right which is a good compromise, I think. The majority of proteins are indeed conserved, but we have a, a minority that evolves rapidly, and it is also depleted in the assays that we study because we are biased to study only humans. So maybe the bottom line is not to study only humans. And uh, with that, I would like uh, uh, to finish to thank uh, you and to thank all the people who uh, uh, are in the lab or have been until very recently in the lab and these are the uh, proteins people to the left, and these are the cell people to the right, and we divide them, but only for the sake of this slide. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, being on time. Uh, we have time for uh, questions. So, yeah. Uh, when you talk about the viral proteins, can you stratify them according to the functionality? Are they essential? What, 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 what part do they take in viral receptivity? Uh, and this can give you a different picture, maybe? Uh, it's an excellent question if we can uh, uh, split them by function. The answer is we didn't try. It's not so easy because most of the virus, viral proteins have no well known function, and many of them are multifunctional. So, capsid proteins can also be anti immunity. Um, we did do it in all sorts of levels, for example, looking at uh, DNA viruses versus RNA viruses. We didn't see much differences. I think these are biophysical principles that govern uh, uh, what we see here rather than function. But it's a good question what happens in the other, on the other side of, of the interaction. Like, because I was like pretending, pretending, sh presenting it as if it's a win-win situation for the virus. However, when you have this motif, that you need to interact with the domain, now you're stuck with the motif. And now we're actually studying it uh, from the other point of view to see the, the viruses. What about the advantage when you turn off the battle rate? And it's a disadvantage if it's conserved. The, the motif, 
the if it is conserved, the immune system, which you know, it's a disadvantage for us. It's a, a, a huge advantage for the virus. If it's conserved, is the virus? No, if the do the domain is conserved. What I'm saying is now we are looking at the motif in the virus to look at the evolution of the viral protein to see if it's stuck in evolution. Yes, and then it can maybe help us. We'll see about that. So. Have you seen the differences between the viruses that uh, cause chronic infection versus acute? That's a good, really, uh, you, you're the first person to ask it in 10 years. But there was a person a that asked it in 10 years ago. Uh, we looked at, so, so viruses with chronic infection tend to have more of these motifs. And we're, we're always afraid of saying that because we don't really know if viruses are acute or chronic, as we know from corona, for example. So, but, but by and large, viruses that are chronic tend to have more of these motifs. Yes. Um, so obviously, the fact that viruses have to attach to conserved domains means that they have limited ability to change, for instance, or spike protein. It has to fit a specific environment. Is there anything um, about that that can be used to target uh, uh, therapies? Is there anything about the fact that, that we know something about what is it is possible that it is useful for the term? So there are all sorts, all sorts of uh, offers in the literature about suggesting, saying, okay, let's use this, let's use this exactly to what you said because it's conserved. But actually, these protein, the human proteins, are highly expressed and are very important. So I'm not so sure that it's a good idea to target them. Maybe only transiently, maybe. But I, I don't know if that's the best strategy. Thank you.